Welcome to this special video edition of Conversations with Chivalry Today. I'm Scott Farrell, host of the Chivalry Today podcast and director of the educational program. And in early 2014, I was asked to coordinate a series of talks in the Southern California area for Dr. Tobias Capwell during the week in October he was going to be in the area for the Tournament of the Phoenix. Dr. Capwell is the Arms and Armor Curator of the Wallace Collection, a renowned art museum in London, and he is particularly known for his practical understanding of the functions of late medieval armor. He has helped design several full sets of armor, which he puts to use in the sport of competitive jousting. The Tournament of the Phoenix is a prestigious, invitational jousting competition, held annually in San Diego, California. Only a handful of the best competitors in the world are invited to take part, and 2014 marked Dr. Capwell's fourth appearance in the event. Recognizing Dr. Capwell's special working knowledge of armor design, and knowing that there are several large Western martial arts and living history communities in the Southern California area, one of the talks I was especially interested in presenting was on the subject of historical design of armor from a working perspective. Thanks to the enthusiasm and generosity of friends at Orange Coast College, we were able to bring Dr. Capwell's talk Building Medieval Plate Armor, an Operator's Guide, to the stage in the college's Robert Moore Theater in a lecture that was free and open to the public. And, for those many folks who weren't able to attend, Chivalry Today was allowed to record Dr. Capwell's lecture and make it available as an online presentation. As with all of our podcasts, the funding for production of this video presentation is provided solely by you, the online audience. This means that, although Orange Coast College provided the theater, and paid Dr. Capwell's speaking fee, and we are most grateful for their generosity in doing that. Chivalry Today received no payment for the time, effort, and resources necessary to arrange Dr. Capwell's appearance. Which is our way of reminding you that if you enjoy the talk you're about to see, please take a moment to visit the Chivalry Today website and make a donation to our program. The donations you make go to support our efforts in creating programming like this, as well as our regular podcasts and all of the articles and information you can enjoy at our website and Facebook page. We do hope that you enjoy this video presentation of Late Medieval Armor, an Operator's Guide by Dr. Tobias Capwell, introduced by Professor Brent Rudman of the Orange Coast College History Department, and me, Scott Farrell, Director of the Chivalry Today Educational Program. Good folks here from the community. It's great to see you all. Uh, this is kind of a special night for us because we don't get to do this every day. It's not every day that somebody comes from London, happens to be on tour, and we have a chance to bring him in thanks to the efforts of, of so many people. And so before I just kind of say a few thank yous here and, and get us started, let me just go ahead and say for those of you that are students here, thank you and welcome. And know that when you leave, uh, there will be, me when, when the seminar is over, uh, you can get extra credits passes right at the exits, any of the exits here. So they're all set. I know, I know, but they're there for you. If we run out, because there's a lot of you, and we're really excited to see you. But if we if we run out, we'll take care of that tomorrow. Uh, so just come see your teacher, and we'll make sure that that professor is ready to give you uh, the points you deserve for getting some culture. Well done. All right, so we're real quick then. Um, Officially, on behalf of Orange Coast College and the Social Sciences Department, I'd like to welcome you all here tonight from the community and, and the campus. And uh, I, I can say that we've definitely been looking forward to gleaning some knowledge from our very knowledgeable and very unique Dr. Capwell, who's uh, somewhere, he's right there uh, uh, waiting for us to get going. And I just want to thank, real, real quick, uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Paul Asim, who's right here, who's been on the Orange Coast uh, uh, College side. Uh, really effective and really helpful for just getting this talk going here for for getting dr capital here and i'd like to mention that uh, doug bennett helped us out quite a bit too from from the from the foundation and also uh also marilyn kelly who is uh, uh the chair of the social sciences department just really involved in this so thank you guys. So and with that said the person I'm going to bring up right now is Scott Farrell, a friend of mine and fellow enthusiast of the medieval arts. And he's the one that really organized the Capwell lectures along the coastline here and works with Dr. Capwell closely. And I'm going to ask him to come on up and, and introduce Dr. Capwell and make some uh, quick announcements as well. Come on up and thank you. Welcome folks and let me uh, begin by kind of echoing uh, 
Brent's statement. Thank you, Brent. Thank you, Paul. Thank you to the staff and uh, uh, folks here at Orange Coast College for giving this talk a home. Uh, thank you all, gosh, for coming out. What a, what a great looking audience here. Um, it's been a pleasure working with you um, and delight to be here this evening. For many of us in the audience, uh, the study and discussion of armor is not just an academic thing. Um, trying to put together and create functional armor that is relatively historically accurate uh, is a difficult thing. And uh, trying to make armor that works and fits and is comfortable and protective uh, can be a difficult process. And sometimes we are essentially trying to recreate the wheel when we do this because if we think about it, we look back into history, people creating armor, fitting armor to its users uh, in the past, struggled with the same problems that we struggle with and, and uh, came up with some creative solutions that sometimes we might not think about today. If only we could crack open the display cases in some of the world's finest museums and see how they solved these problems hundreds of years ago, it would go a long way to helping us make armor that's both properly functional and historically accurate. Well, someone here has had the opportunity to do just that. Uh, Dr. Capwell is certainly a scholar of armor uh, in terms of art and function, but he's also a user of armor. Uh, he is here in Southern California this week uh, preparing for a jousting competition down in Southern California that will put his practical knowledge of how to build and, and uh, create a suit of armor that is functional and protective, we'll put that to the test. Dr. Capwell is curator of arms and armor at the Wallace Collection in London, which is one of the most recognized and respected uh, collections of medieval and Renaissance arms and armor uh, in all of Europe. Uh, he's quite well known for his academic work, but for our purposes tonight, uh, he is a fellow builder and user and designer of armor, just like many of us are. Uh, he was recently involved in a project that the Wallace Collection dubbed Armageddon, which involved a team of curators, photographers, and handlers creating a pictorial catalog with over 7,000 high-resolution digital images and a searchable da database of most, if not all, of the armor that the Wallace Collection has uh, in, in its collection. Uh, the photographs and accompanying hardbound book Masterpieces of European Arms and Armor in the Wallace Collection, which was authored by Dr. Capwell, has won several prestigious awards, including Book of the Year from Apollo Magazine. He's currently working on a three-volume, uh, he's currently working on the first in a three-volume uh, book collection of late medieval English-style armor, uh, and I am delighted to be able to introduce him here tonight for his talk, Building Medieval Armor, an Operator's Guide. Please help, help me in welcoming Dr. Tobias Kaplan. Well, thank you. A bit awestruck, actually. Um, yes, I, I thought uh, armor is a very personal thing. It's, um, in my experience as an art historian, it's one of the most personal of all medieval and Renaissance art forms. Uh, it's part of you. It's a human exoskeleton. It becomes part of your body. It becomes part of you. And for that reason, I found it to be an extraordinary window right back into the human experience of five, six, seven hundred years ago. And for a lot of history students, you can probably empathize with one of the difficulties of studying history being that it starts to feel very detached from human experience. It's obscure dates and battles and grand political movements, but it's hard to get a sense that this is stuff happening to people just like us. And sometimes a beautiful painted altarpiece an extraordinary sculpture where we can't imagine how, what, what could have taken to, to create these things. It can all see very, seem very distant somehow and hard to get one's head around on a personal, human, empathetic, emotional level. 
And armor, for me, has always kind of cut through all of that. An armor stood in a museum gallery looks like a person. It's very immediate, it's very primal, and, and it's, a, it's sort of immediate impact on you. And, and certainly, armor is an extraordinary way of coming into personal contact with historical figures. Certainly, when you see an armor in a museum that you know belong to a famous historical character, let's say you encounter one of Henry VIII's armors at the Tower of London, when you stand next to that armor, you stand next to Henry VIII himself in quite an immediate way. It's a much more, um, pow for me, a powerful, immediate connection with a historical figure. You know, painted portraits by Holbein are all very well, but it's, <laughs> it's egg yolk and pigments smeared on a piece of wood, you know? It's not the guy stood there in front of you. Um, and I think it's very important for anyone studying history on any level to at least stay mindful of that basic human truth. And we can talk, you know, we can write these extraordinary research papers with lots of impressive footnotes, but if you lose track of the fact that this is about people's lives, it's all kind of pointless as far as I'm concerned. So. As, an artifact, as a class of artifacts, as, I mean, you can almost treat armor as a personification of the, the historical process. Um, it's a great way in. And once you start getting your head around the idea of looking at an armor as a work of art, at the same time as it's a piece of technology, um, you can start treating anything like that. You can start looking at altarpieces like that. Uh, for, a, for a medieval person, an altarpiece is just as utilitarian, just as practical a tool as it is a work of art. You know, modern, modern conceptions of what is utilitarian and what is artistic, what is a tool and what is a work of art, uh, it's, it, it's nonsense in a medieval and Renaissance context. Um, they don't recognize those sort of distinctions. You talk to a lot of modern art historians and they They'll tell you that a work of art should exist for no other reason than whatever expressive concept the artist had in mind. It should just sit up there on the wall and express whatever, it, whatever message it has for us. And if it does anything practical, if it's a tool, if it's a hammer, if it's a, a vice, even if you know, it's beautifully etched in gilt, it's just a mere tool. Um, but for a medieval person, an altarpiece is a tool also. It's how we commune with the divine, and that's an everyday practical process. So I think for building armor and understanding armor on that personal practical level, the key for me has always been to get myself my, into their heads, you know, to get my, my own head around the mentality, uh, because that's the starting point. And that's the key to understanding any art form. You have to understand what it meant to the people who were there, the people who created it, the people who paid for it, uh, the people who wore it, the people who got killed wearing it in some cases. That's understanding the mindset is the key to doing it well. And that actually also makes the whole, that makes the whole thing worthwhile. You know, what, what, what's the point otherwise? So I thought tonight it would be fun to, um, to talk about some of these issues, to look at some real pieces of armor and see you know, what, what they can tell us, what an examination of the actual object can tell us, um, and how we can start to get a better understanding of the mindset of the people um, living at the time through the objects and through our investigation of them. And then I'll, I thought it would be, it'd be fun also to talk about a few of my own armor projects, my own armor building projects. Each of them were very different in different ways. I learned a lot, different kinds of things from different projects, working with different armors, strange, mysterious characters that they are. They, <laughs> they, teach, you, they teach you all kinds of things. And for me, actually, in many cases, the process of building an armor was far more important and useful than having the thing when it was done. 
then I seem to have a habit of losing interest and move on to something else. An expensive process, that. <laughs> so, again, to go back to the, con the original meaning and context, you know, armor is just impregnated with the spirit of the age in which it was made. Um, these days, when you, when you go to a museum, modern art museum, like the Wallace Collection, you'll find, for example, you'll find all of the armor stuck in one room by itself, divorced from the painting and the sculpture and the bronzes and the, everything else. And um, that leads us to kind of imagine it as existing in its own isolated bubble. And we have to kind of get, up, get back to the idea that armor is part, it's an integral, inextricable part of a much wider artistic, technological, social environment. It's, it's kind of like the idea of, you know, what is an armorer? You know, an armorer is not a hairy blacksmith living at the bottom of someone's garden, working by himself with no communication with the outside world. Well, maybe that's what they are like now, today, sometimes. <laughs> um, but that's not what they were like in the 15th century. Um, in the 15th century, an armorer was a very, very highly paid, famous, craftsman, biomechanic, artist, sculptor, sculptor in steel, uh, but also a military engineer. These people were valuable. Their skills, their experience was valuable. Uh, many of them were very famous, and they knew the famous painters, the famous sculptors. They collaborated with artists working in other media. They corresponded with scientists and, uh, and engineers and inventors. They're part of the whole environment. When we understand that, armor again becomes a way in to all of medieval and Renaissance art. Um, when you take, for example, the Italian, uh, a fine Italian armor of the middle of the 15th century, and then you look at the art of that same time, you find the armor appearing everywhere in the art, serving all of the purposes of Renaissance artists. We actually have to take some of the credit for the power of those Piero della Francesca's and Mantegna's and uh, those, th those famous works of art, and we have to take some of the credit away from them. Because when you put a beautiful armor in a painting, you're hijacking all of the real world meaning that already existed. You know, this is a, these are objects of power and they had that power in the real world. When you paint them well, you appropriate that power, but you can't have credit for it. Piero della Francesca owes the armor in a big way. Um, and this is often, armor carries meaning. And if you don't understand the language of armor, the vocabulary of armor, you don't understand the full impact of the work of art. You don't understand what these artists are trying to communicate. You might get a general message. You might get the first layer of meaning, but you're not getting all of the subtext. So basically, if you accept that a respectable understanding of any period in art history is based on some kind of decent grasp of what it meant to the people who were there, and then if you also can see the essential social, expressive, technological, military, economic, artistic significance of armor, that the, those key roles that it plays in late medieval and Renaissance life. If you take both of those things as two parts of an equation, the inescapable conclusion is that you cannot have a respectable understanding of medieval and Renaissance art without some kind of decent working awareness of arms and armor. It's as simple as that. So, um, there are a number of challenges that put themselves in the way of you as someone who's interested in learning more about what armor really was in its own time. One of the basic challenges 
is that even the best, rarest, most spectacular armor survivals look very different now than they did when they were new, when they were, when they were in the state that their creator intended them to be. And it's a very long process that requires a lot of research and time and thought and reading and comparative work to get from where we are now to where we should be in our 14th century, in this case, 14th century investigations. But that's good, you know, it gives us a reason to go out and look at things. We have a mission. You're not just randomly reading historical texts because it's on your reading list. You have something you need to achieve. I need to know what this Vacht of Match, in this case, this North Italian nobleman, actually meant his armor to be. And, you know, even in very good condition, pretty much all of the organic materials that make up the full picture of the armor are lost. The decorative textile elements, the leather elements, the linings, um, the decorative elements are all usually all gone. Um, this is a very unusual armor in that it survives in such relatively good condition, but it's one thing to have the armor and it's another thing to have everything that goes with it. I love this document. This is a series of drawings by an unknown Padovan artist. And I often refer to this as a, as a way into the idea that armor can have rather more specific meanings to people who know what they're looking at than just, he's a soldier, he's a warrior, whatever. This series of, of drawings represents, as it says, illustrious men from history illustrious warriors, military leaders, kings, princes, emperors. Uh, and it's telling this illustrious warrior story all the way from ancient biblical times, all the way through to nearly the present time of the drawing's creation. And, the, and you've got all of these scores of different characters. Of course, they've been conveniently Named. He's written who he intends these different characters to represent, which is helpful. Um, but a lot of their identity is created through their personal armor and equipment in the drawing. Uh, so, for example, many of them, the, the, the characters that are seen to be later, the later medieval characters, the characters that are seen to be part of the artist's own era, are shown in the arms and armor, the equipment of the artist's own time, uh, whereas some of the ancient biblical characters are shown in various grades of uh, Roman armor or Greek armor, the, you know, the Renaissance conception of that. And then by using the different forms of armor, he can give us a nice sense of chronological progression through history. And that comes across very strongly if you know what you're looking for. So this is starting to introduce the expressive, quite specific narrative power that armor can have. You wouldn't have thought it, but it really does work this way. And there are other very interesting, very specific characterizations that can come out through these military garments when you know what to look for. This is uh, King Syphax. Syphax was a Numidian king who fought with the Carthaginians uh, against the Romans in the Second Punic War in the second century BC. And Syphax got beaten by the Romans uh, under Scipio Africanus, and he was taken prisoner and taken back to Rome as a trophy, essentially, and died in Roman captivity. So the artist, our Padawan Renaissance artist, wants to tell it, wants to encapsulate all of Syphax's key attributes um, in one image. And we won't get that message unless we understand arms and armor. Um, here you can see, although he, it's unfortunate that he's wearing a gown over his, over his, uh, his doublet, you can see his, the coat that he's wearing underneath has lines of quilting. 
It's also got points or laces on the upper arms. Those are attachment points for armor. Uh, and then down he's got more laces coming off of his hip, uh, the area of his hip on the doublet. Those are for the suspension of the leg armor. He's being, he's an ancient character, but he's being shown in a 15th century way for the sake of convenience. Um, so it's, that's an arming doublet. That's the very specific garment that you almost never see depicted in art because we usually see them with their armor on. This is a very rare occasion where the artistic context is such that we know that's the elusive garment that's meant to be worn under the armor. And the message is that this is a warrior who has been stripped and he's manacled and yet he wears the crown. He's a warrior king who's been stripped and taken prisoner. That message comes across much more powerfully if you know what his jacket is all about. And for arms and armor historians, it's really important because we, you can count the number of depictions of arming doublets on one hand and still have some fingers left. Now, to the objects themselves. Armor is obviously, 15th century armor is made out of iron or steel. And because it's made of metal, a lot of strange associations can, assumptions can be made about it. It's often assumed to be very inflexible. You can't move very well in it. It's very heavy. It's very uncomfortable. It's very immovable. Um, you know, we take a basic idea of the characteristics of a lump of the material sitting on the table and we attribute it to the thing made out of that substance. And actually, when you start looking at armor, and you hold the real pieces in your hands, it's often a very surprising experience because it, it often goes against what your naive expectations might be leading you to think. For example, thickness. Um, we might think that a heavy armor is heavy because it's thick metal all over. Um, but one of the extraordinary things about good quality plate armor in the 14th, 15th, and 16th centuries is that the thickness is extraordinarily variable. They need it to be thick and strong in certain areas, but they have to manage the weight. An armor, a field armor for war, the, the cutoff point is right around 25 kilos. In any period, it can't really go above that because then it's gonna stop being useful. As it gets heavier, the benefits of wearing it go down, or the price is not, it becomes too high to pay. When armor became too heavy in the 17th century because they were trying to make it bulletproof, people just started refusing to wear it. Wear it. Once it goes over that 25 kilo mark or so, people won't wear it anymore. 50, maybe 60 pounds. Sorry, I'm, I think metric now. I've been in the UK for 20 years. Um, uh, so the weight of the armor has to be managed very carefully. Uh, this, ha this is a helmet in the Wallace collection. And um, it both confirms and denies the stereotype of the really heavy armor at the same time. The front of the visor, the front of the face, is um, six millimeters thick, um, which is proof against most, maybe some modern firearms, actually. Um, but that's just at the front. I'm trying to figure out this pointer here. Um, uh oh, that was the wrong thing to press. Oh. Um, escape. I don't have an escape. There we go. I'll just do it the old fashioned way. Um, the front of the visor is six millimeters thick, but if you follow that same plate, around to the sides where it pivots, the, the arms of the pivots, it's less than two millimeters thick. It goes from six millimeters down to less than two in only that short space, from the, the distance from your nose to your cheekbone somewhere. The, the thickness changes very radically. This makes it very hard for modern armors to replicate because we get, we get modern spring steel in consistently thick plates. We get something that's two millimeters thick. We don't get something that's six millimeters thick on one side and two millimeters thick on the other side. 
it's very difficult for us now to replicate the kind of results that they were getting then. But those kind of extreme changes in thickness are what make it really strong where it needs to be strong, but it keeps that weight at the manageable level. So that is a key thing for making better armor as an operator. I refer to this incidentally as the operator's guide because I'm not an armorer. I'm speaking about armor from the point of view of the person inside, the operator. I refer to it as an operator because I often feel like it's off, wearing an armor is like operating a piece of machinery. You need to know what you can do and you need to know what you can't do. You need to know what your abilities are and how to exploit them. If you're fighting in full plate armor against people who aren't wearing much armor, you can hit them with pretty much any part of your body and hurt them. That's an advantage, but there are disadvantages as well. And learning what you can do and how you can work in it is, is a pretty advanced skill, actually. So that's what, what I refer to as the operator's guide. And that's the perspective uh, on this that I'm speaking of tonight. Now, another key issue in understanding what a piece of armor is and what it meant to the people who made it and where it belongs in, in the world that created it is just considering the quality. And when you're making an armor, you need to be very clear about what sort of quality, what sort of social rank, what sort of fighting function you are after. For example, let's compare three helmets in the Wallace collection. Three salads, they're all salads, the typical uh, helmet of the 15th and early 16th centuries. Uh, this, is, this one is what you might call a munition grade helmet. It's basically as cheap and crappy as you can get away with and still have a helmet that will basically protect you. Uh, and it, and it, it's a great myth that the only people wearing plate armor were the knightly class. Everybody wore armor of some kind, as much often as much armor as they could afford, or as much armor as they could wear and still do their job, whether they are archers, crossbowmen, whatever. So this is not just about the elite knightly class. The subject of armor spans the entire social spectrum. And this is for someone pretty low on that social spectrum, at the, at the poor end. You look at this helmet, it's only been worked to the minimum extent necessary to make it work as a helmet. Will that piece of metal work if I stick a chin strap on it? Okay, put it out the door, we have to make another 20 by the end of the week. Um, so it really looks like a half-made helmet. This is what a helmet, a nice salad, looks like when it's half-finished. And there's still a lot of forging left to do. That the tail, how the, how the tail of the helmet comes off the top of the skull and travels almost in a straight line down to the point. It doesn't follow the, the shape of the skull and the nape of the neck at all as a nice salad should, as we shall see. But that will work as a helmet if we stick a chin strap on it. Um, if you look at it, you spend a little time with this helmet and look at it, um, it's really rough, it's really asymmetric, the lines are all over the place. If you raise the visor, it goes off to one side. Um, you look at where the pivot points are. The pivot points are completely different levels. <laughs> Um, I mean, a, a little bit of difference in the height is good because it makes the visor stay up, but it doesn't have to be that much. He's just eyeballing this and working really fast. Um, this is a cheap helmet. This is the type of helmet that was made by the thousands. The armorers in G the German lands, the armorers in Italy, were exporting thousands and thousands and thousands of helmets. And to make that economically viable, they had to work quickly. If we move ourselves a little bit up the spectrum, this is a nicer helmet, but it's still not a great one. Um, this actually recently was a, this is this is a nice example of how the subject of arms and armor, from a scholarly point of view, is very rich. There is loads of original research, basic original research in this academic area that's just waiting to be done. If you're studying English, there's not much left to say about Chaucer, but. <laughs> If you go into arms and armor, 
there are a lot of basic questions that have not been dealt with yet. From an academic point, I think it's very rewarding. Anyway, this helmet has only just in the last year been discovered uh, to have been made in Frankfurt. Frankfurt isn't very famous as an armor-making center, but it seems there was an armor-making community there. Some of just in the last year, some of the maker's marks for the city of uh, Frankfurt have been identified, and this is a Frankfurt helmet. That's pretty interesting. Frankfurt isn't what I'd call Southern Germany, and Southern Germany is the famous place where armor was always supposed to be made, so this is opening up a new part of the story. And this is a better helmet than the last one. You can see that it has a more refined shape, but it's still not a great one. If you look at some of the details, you know, it's still someone, this is a respectable craftsman, but again, he, he's someone who knows what he's doing, having to work quickly, because he has another 10 to make that week. Um, and if you look at some of the details, this is the thing also about armor. The meaning is in the details. It's like a great myth, a great traditional ancient story, like Gilgamesh or something. The meaning, the, 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 uh, the power, symbolic power of the story is in those funny little details that you sort of have to sit and think about for a while. It's very much like that with a piece of armor. You have to look at those funny little details. Um, and, and contemplate what they mean. Look at the turned edge. The turned edge along the base of the helmet. It's pretty wobbly. It takes a lot of time and skill to get that straight and clean and nice looking. If you don't have the time, a wobbly turn will still do its job out the door. That's, that's the Frankfurt mark right on the front of the face, by the way. And elsewhere, the metal's a little uneven, heterogeneous, it's a bit rough and dirty metallurgically. Um, better, but not great. This is a great one. This is a really nice South German salad. Compared to the first one, the shape is extraordinarily refined. It still survives with something of its original finish as well. Incredibly smooth, incredibly bright, sur polished, beautiful surface. Um, and uh, ignore that roller, incidentally. That roller was put on later when the helmet was converted for use in a, in a particular kind of joust. But it's originally a field helmet. If you just kind of erase the roller in your imagination. I'd do it on Photoshop if I knew how to do that. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but again, just look at the form. Look at the, the confidence, the presence of the piece. Uh, and again, if we look at those details, uh, look, at, look at the difference in the turn. It's straight, it's clean, it's boxed, it's butch, it's, you know, someone has spent a lot, had the, the, the luxury to spend a lot more time refining the shape. It's probably made for someone much more important, so it has to have the appropriate level of quality. So just in those three helmets, there's no surface decoration to speak of, really, but just in the quality of the work, you can start to see the the messages that pieces of armor can put out. And I've found that in building armor, understanding the mindset behind it is very important because it, it just leads you down paths of questioning and inquiry and contemplation in the design and function of equipment that would just never occur to you otherwise. Uh, so, surface decoration. This is obviously very important. One of the, of course, an armor a piece of armor is a work of art on many different levels. Um, but the two key levels really are as the pure sculptural form, as we've just seen, the, the essential qualities of the, the, the object. So it's a sculpture. But of course, an armor is also a surface onto which can be placed all kinds of extraordinary applied decoration. And the decoration is where the messages of the armor start coming across in a much more complex way. And this is the type of decoration, the quality of the decoration is directly related to how much money you have to spend on the thing and who you are in society, what is appropriate for you to be wearing, and what messages are appropriate for you to be putting out. Armor is like a billboard. It's sending out these messages about the person inside all of the time. So using a, a set of 
Wallace Collection helmets, we can illustrate this quite nicely. Here's another salad. This is another munitions grade piece. It's a pretty rubbish piece of armor. It's a not very good quality metal. It's only been worked as much as will take it to the point when it can be stuck on someone's head. But at the same time, it's got this extraordinary painted decoration. Um, paint, painted armor is not something many people uh, can imagine, but a lot more armor was painted than we tend to realize. Um, paint is a relatively cheap way of making rubbish armor look much nicer than it actually is. Um, and uh, I mean, the monster face on this one is fantastic. There's actually good evidence to, to show that the painted schemes of these helmets were ways of identifying uh, particular squadrons of light cavalry and mounted crossbowmen and things. So there was probably a monster squad of 15 or 20 guys who all had their helmets painted in this way. Uh, and they were probably in the service of the city of Nuremberg, so they have big ends painted on the back of the helmet. Interestingly, on the back, so that the guys behind them can see who they are. You know, if you look at the, you know, when soldiers or, or, you know, riot police paint their ID numbers on their equipment, they put it on the back of the helmet, which is quite interesting, because you need your guys to know who's who. Um, this, notice also the lines painted on the skull, these vertical lines. This is a period when embossed flutes, embossed lines were becoming very fashionable. Uh, but the embossed lines, the, the embossed flutes are very expensive. And he's trying to follow the fashion as best he can by just painting the flutes on. It's quite, quite a, a fascinating object in lots of ways. So mixing linseed oil with pigment and smearing it on your cheap crappy helmet leads to a, an artistic artifact now of extraordinary rarity. The Victorians, the 19th century collectors, didn't want painted armor. They wanted a bright, shiny armor. So they, paint, they often polished off original 15th and 16th century painted surfaces. Uh, and this is one of the only ones that survived. This is a, this is a kind of weird thing, actually, that the, the style of helmet that once was perhaps the, mo the cheapest and most common is now the rarest in my museum gallery, the rarest and therefore one of the most important. I've got lots of etched and gilt armor, you know. That's common in my gallery, and this is a complete sort of flip on what the original relative context would have been. So, moving up the pecking order a little bit, a polished helmet. We take polished metal for granted now in the modern world. We're used to seeing shiny things. Making things shiny is easy. Uh, you know, you have your electric powered polishing equipment, you've got modern polishing compounds, you've got chrome, you've got all kinds of fantastic modern materials. We're used to, you know, chrome on 57 Chevys and, you know, polished stainless steel. It's common for us. It's hard, therefore, to imagine the power, the symbolic power, that a shiny metal surface would have for a 15th or 16th century person. Polishing metal uh, to, this, to a high degree of shine was extremely laborious. It required a lot of specialist equipment, water-powered polishing wheels, specialist polishers. Um, it's very, very expensive. Um, but they could do it. They could do it to an extraordinary extent. Look at this detail I'm just showing you down here. This is a photograph taken in the 1930s when they ground out some original 15th century rivets uh, and took away a reinforcing plate from this helmet to reveal the original polished surface beneath that had been protected by the overlaying plate. And we see here a polished surface as it was the day the thing was released from the workshop. You can see the reflection of the gentleman curator's pocket watch in the, the surface of the steel. It's kind of a weird photograph. You have to kind of stare at it a bit before you realize what you're looking at. Is everybody getting that, more or less? Yeah. I mean, it, it looks like chrome. It looks like highly polished stainless steel. This is not stainless steel. This is 15th century carbon steel. Um, but that was expensive. That was extraordinarily expensive. 
If, let's say you buy a, re a reasonably nice armor today, and it's a polished, shiny, beautiful looking armor from one of the more reputable makers, um, and it costs you $20,000. Now, in that situation, between three and maybe tops, $5,000 of that total cost is the polishing, the grinding and polishing. So let's say it's 20, maximum 25% of the total cost of an armor today. It would be 75% of that cost if you didn't polish it. In the, middle, in the late Middle Ages and in the, the 16th century, for example, the, there are good documentary records of this by the 16th century, the polish, a nice polish, could be up to 80% of the total cost of the armor. So if we go back to your $20,000 armor in late medieval or Renaissance terms, you would get the exact same armor that functioned and fit and did exactly what you needed it to do for $5,000 as you would for $20,000. You know, that's $15,000 of polish. Um, so what are the implications of that? The implications are that when you see a 15th or 16th century person sees one of these shiny armors, it's meaningful. It's powerful. It says a lot about the person inside. Um, and they're not going to be as common as we often perhaps imagine. Once you can get a decent polish, of course, there's lots more money to be spent doing other things to it. For example, heat tinting or blueing, as it's sometimes called. Uh, blue, the process of blueing gets you other colors besides blue. Um, the best can get you this wonderful kind of iridescent peacock blue purpley color if it's done really well. It's hard to do well because it's dependent on pretty precise temperature and time control. And you can't really measure temperature or time very well in the 15th or 16th centuries. It's dependent on the empirical skill of the master that he knows that the right temperature is when he throws some sticks into the kiln and they spontaneously combust. And then if you throw the piece of armor in there and you go and say a couple, 10 Hail Marys, that's about the right amount of time. Whatever the technique was, they never wrote these things down to tell us, but um, it's, it's a skill-based thing and it's an additional expense. You can't get a really beautiful blued surface unless you have a really fantastic polish first. So we're building the level of richness up and up and up and up. And this is starting to show us how complex and specific the messages inherent in the armor can be. Um, certainly, once you get to the beginning of the 16th century, you can also now etch designs onto the armor using acid. Um, I'm kind of sometimes reluctant to try and run through a, a, a process, an artistic process, in, in, when I don't have very long to talk about it, because you're always in the, uh, you're also always running the risk of making it sound pretty simple and easy and straightforward. Acid etching is not simple or easy or straightforward at all. Uh, very, very difficult actually. When you look at real etching on real armor, the the consistency and the um, over a whole armor is spectacular. The control these people had of their materials. They're, they're etching the steel with highly toxic, highly corrosive materials. Um, many of the etchant recipes, the, the central ingredient is something they call sublimate, which is mercuric chloride. Um, yeah, it's not something you can go down to the corner store and buy exactly. Um, pretty horrible stuff. Um, but they had the command of these materials and the etching is now increasing the level of richness of, of one of these armors. Um, once you get into the, you know, the realm of the really spectacular armors, you're entering a, a situation where it's not a matter of just one decorative technique being applied um, you know, to a high degree. The real cleverness of armor decoration is using multiple techniques and combining them to create much more interesting, much more shocking, uh, much more unusual visual effects. So here, once you have the polishing and the bluing and the etching, you add gold. Gold is only to be found on the armors 
of members of the knightly class. It's one of these things. It's, you know, you have to be of a certain rank to be really allowed to wear it and certainly to afford it to begin with. Uh, a process like fire gilding, where you're mixing gold with mercury, applying it to the steel, and then boiling off the mercury, creating lots of poisonous, horrible fumes. Um, you bond the, the, the gold permanently to the metal. And it's a thick layer of gold. You need a lot of gold to pull this off well. Um, there are surviving accounts of armors, how, they, how much they cost. And you can see that a rich armor for the Archduke of the Tyrol costs, in modern terms, $3.5 million. And they don't even include the cost of the gold. He has to buy the gold separately. That's another $650,000 just for the gold for the decoration. So we're entering the realm of extreme luxury. Uh, but here, even on a very rich armor, this is a helmet in the Wallace collection made for a, a, a German archduke. Uh, he still left large parts of his helmet plain and polished. But when you're the Holy Roman Emperor, you might as well cover the entire thing <laughs> in, in um, etching and gilding. A fully gilded armor, incidentally, is reserved for only the members of the highest ranks in Renaissance society. Kings, emperors, and some, maybe a couple of really high-ranking, rich, and aspiring dukes wear fully gilded armor. So you get the whole, from moving clockwise from the top around, you start to get a sense of how specific the armor can be in indicating the status of the person inside. And all that money spent on the decoration works as a form of life insurance also. Because it doesn't always work out, of course. Plenty of high-ranking people end up getting killed in medieval and renaissance battles. But if you can help it, you're not going to be stupid enough to kill someone in fully gilded armor. You might get a couple of your friends, go beat him up, take him prisoner, and sell him back to his family for an enormous amount of money. Um, the armor has all kinds of integral functions that, you know, when you sit and think about them, they spider out in all kinds of interesting ways. Just to continue with this helmet for a second, I didn't know the screen they were going to give me was going to be this big, but, uh, you know, that's nice. Um, this, this is a gilded surface. Uh, that survives, again, protected by an overplate. I was able to take this off of this helmet because the overplate's not riveted on. I didn't have to take a grinder to the 16th century rivets. It's it just, there's, there's two convenient threaded bolt holes there, and you take two bolts off. You take this plate off. Uh, interestingly, the reinforcing plate on this helmet, you turn it over and look at the inside, is still coated with its original beeswax coating. There's even a couple of 16th century thumbprints where the, the people were working it into the steel. The contemporary uh, chivalric treatises, a couple of them, say that you should coat the inside of your arm, your head plates, your helmet and your other plates with beeswax so that your helmet does not ring like a bell when it's struck. <laughs> Uh, mine does, actually. I was struggling with this problem on Sunday, think, contemplating uh, this weekend when I'm going to be get, getting hit in the head by an axe wielded by a big Russian. Um, and my, my helmet does go bang! And I'm, I'm looking around for beeswax. I ordered some. I hope it's, I hope it's arrived tomorrow because I'm going to put beeswax in my helmet as a matter of urgency. Anyway, the overplate and the beeswax have protected this surface. And that Ignore the sort of scratchy bits. The middle area here is an original fire-gilded surface that is as clean and perfect as the day it was made. The rest of the helmet's kind of matte, finished, and scratched and banged up. It's 500 years old. It's had a hard life. Um, but the, the real surface is meant to look like a gold mirror. And this whole armor once looked like that. We only have the helmet and the stirrups surviving. But there was a complete armor head to toe in gold, the horse armor was gold, the saddle was gold, the caparison was cloth of gold. You know, this is a pretty powerful message. You have to remember that knights, the knightly class, viewed themselves as the wielders of divine power. 
They, they are the chosen elite warrior class that God has chosen to protect and defend the rest of us. That's the idea anyway. And the archangels, the warrior saints, are members of that warrior hierarchy. The hierarchy of knighthood extends into the divine realm. So an armor like this is selling that message. An armor like this transforms its wearer into a semi-divine being. And most ordinary people in the 16th century don't see solid gold armor very often. They, their lives are mainly brown and green, and there's some blue sky and some sunshine, but you don't see this kind of thing very often. So this is a very literal manifestation of divine power on earth in front of you. It reinforces the belief system in literal terms. So I can't think of that many other art forms that do that quite so powerfully. So, changing tack slightly. Uh, for the last 20 years or so, I've been doing this practically. It all started when I was four years old and I wandered into the armor court at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. And the, the equestrian figures there had an enormous effect on a, a four-year-old mind. And I've been, I wanted instantly to be one of those creatures. And this is a, a, a problem I've had for the rest of my life. Uh, I've been chasing this idea for the rest of my life. Um, and I've built a number of armors in 20 years. I've probably built about 10 major armor projects in 20 years. That's, two, that's one every couple of years. That's kind of a scary thought, actually. It's certainly an expensive process. Um, but I've worked with some of the greatest armors alive today. Some of them are no longer alive. And I've learned a lot from working with those people. Um, I've spent a lot of time sitting around drinking cups of tea in armor's workshops, waiting for them to need to offer something up to me before they go back to ignoring me for another couple of hours. Um, so I thought it would be interesting to look at a couple of those projects as a way of kind of unpacking some of these other issues. Um, an armor that I, that I uh, had built between 1997, 1998, 99 was a, a, a German Gothic armor. This is the first armor I built after I had really entered the museum profession in a serious way. This is the first armor I built where I had access to the real stuff. Um, for example, the back plate. This back plate I was quite proud of because the original that I was working from is in the Royal Armouries collection. The Royal Armouries was where I was working at the time, so I could get it out of the case. I could take tracings of the plates, the way the, the, the plates were scalloped and cut and decorated. I could then take those to my armor and say, do it like that. And, I, and the results immediately were, were much better. Um, uh, one of the things I was interested in this armor, is that it was kind of a new, a new idea for me at the time was, I, I was, I've always been very interested in style, in the style of the armor. Different styles arise in different places. There's all kinds of Germanic styles, there's Iberian styles, Italian styles, French styles, English styles. There's a very regional uh, level to what people thought looked good. The Germans had a very different idea of what they thought looked good. The Spanish would never go near German armor. They didn't like what it looked like. And you know, functionally, the style has to serve the way you expect to fight. The Italians fight in a different way than the Germans. They need different equipment. And I, at this point, when I was building this armor, I was getting really interested in that and the way different styles interact and armorers traveling from place to place. We often think of artists and sculptors and armorers, craftspeople, in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance as being very, very uh, location specific. If you're in Augsburg, you stay in Augsburg and traveling is hard so medieval people didn't do it very much. It's not true. These people were whizzing around all over the place and armorers, you know, were relocating to different cities depending on different projects. 
You might get Augsburg arborers moving to Lansut if there was work there, if there was a good project happening, if they needed another etcher. You relocate for the work. A lot of this is very much contract-based work. So when you've got all of those craftspeople, all those designers, plate workers, etchers, guilders, moving all around, they're bound to be influencing each other. And I was very interested at this point in the, way, the ways that styles can combine. There are styles that seem to be very consistent, German, Italian, whatever, but there's a lot of armor that seems to be having elements of different styles combined together in all kinds of different ways. And I was quite interested in that. So I wanted to try to build a German armor that had certain key Italian features. It was, I was seeing this in a number of the surviving objects. Uh, at Kerber Castle in the Italian Tyrol, for example. This is culturally a very um, um, uh, uh, heterogeneous place. There are Italians who speak Italian with a German accent. There are Germans who speak Italian. You know, it's, it's, a, it's an Italo-German region. And when you look at the armor at Kerberg, it also has that kind of flavor. It looks Italian, but it looks German at the same time. And I wanted to see what building one of those would be like. Um, so this is a piece, for example, at Kerberg, where the cuirass uh, and parts of the armor look very Germanic, but it has asymmetrical pauldrons that look much more italian uh, On the back, there they are. They're essentially Italian uh, pieces but they've got sort of Germanic sprays of fluting on them. They're, they're, there's something interesting going on there stylistically. So this is the kind of thing I wanted to build. But um, you know, I didn't actually know very much about what I was doing as a designer, as a, uh, as a leader on a project like this. And I made a number of mistakes. And one of the mistakes that I made that I would, I would, I would suggest that it might be a good idea to be conscious of when when you go out and build your own armors, if you're not already, is um, don't let picky personal preferences take over the whole thing. <laughs> you know, oh, I like this, but I don't like that. I like that bit of that armor, but I don't like this. You know, and if you if you if you get too much into that cycle and you you start to ignore what your references actually are, you start traveling very far away from anything resembling historical authenticity. And I like these pauldrons, but I didn't like the fluting. So I changed the fluting, um, inspired by uh, Carpaccio's famous St. George. You can see his pauldrons a little better in another version of this that Carpaccio did on a smaller level. The main one is a huge fresco. This is a little panel painting. You can see that he's got the same kind of pauldrons, but there's more of a, a sort of Batman thing going on there. Um, I, was 20, you know, I was 23 years old, you know, give me a break. Um, the, the, uh, the helmet was technologically something I was very interested in at the time, something that looks like a separate salad and bever. Um, the prop, one of the key design principles of armor is that you have, on the one hand, mobility, and on the other hand, protection. And these things are inversely proportional. You increase one, you lose on the other. You increase protection, the armor gets stiffer and thicker and heavier. You lose on mobility. You increase on mobility, you articulate the plates more, you make the plates lighter, more flexible. You lose on protection. It's, it really goes up and down like that. And each style of armor finds its own balance. It weights very heavily one way or another way, or it tries to even things out. That's a, that's a really key thing to keep in mind. I wanted a salad and bever type of thing because uh, you know, this is the Germanic style. The problem with the Salat and Bever, when you have one plate like that protecting your chin, and you have another plate like that coming down protecting your upper face, and they move like that, they also open like that. So a lance can come and strike you straight in the face if you're not keeping your head down properly. And this is an interesting design that appears in the late 15th century, where it looks like the classic Salat and Bever, but the bever is actually pivoted onto the helmet. This is the genesis of the 16th century clothes helmet, essentially. It's a much stronger design, practically, but it maintains the kind of aesthetic appearance I was after. This was the first piece that was made for me by Robert McPherson. Again, probably one of the greatest uh, living armorers, um, even though he'd never admit it. 
Um, and this is an example of how, through a commission of a particular piece, the armor I was working with making the rest of the armor couldn't do helmets. It's funny that some, sometimes an armor can be really good at one part of the body and terrible at another part of the body. And Peter, the armor I was working with on this project, was fantastic at arms and legs and gauntlets and feet, uh, fantastic greaves, lower legs. Couldn't do helmets, just couldn't do helmets, forget it. Just, just one of these funny things. So I had the helmet by Robert McPherson, um, and that was the beginning of a, of a beautiful friendship. So the arms are an interesting example, again, where my weird personal uh, preferences kind of took over and were in danger of spoiling the project. I had this thing about wanting big elbows, big fluty elbows. Um, and if you'd asked me at the time, I would have told you that my inspiration was this armor. This is the famous equestrian armor in the Wallace Collection. At the time, I would have laughed in your face if you told me one day I'd be responsible for this collection. Um, this is not obviously equestrian at the moment. Um, this, we, we photographed it on foot when we were doing the, the catalog project, the Wallace Collection. Um, it's tall, it's, it's a composite armor. It's not made out of pieces that are, belong to go, that are supposed to go together, but, but it's, a, it's a tall armor and it's got those fantastic elbows. They're not as big as the ones I made. Um, but that's what I would have told you in trying to preserve my scholarly integrity. Uh, that's what I've told you where the inspiration was coming from. But actually, the truth of it is, and I will make confession at this point, some people talk to psychiatrists or their priests, I speak to large groups of people, um, that that wasn't really what was going on. What was really going on was a child's fascination coming in here. I'd seen a film that made a big impression on me when I was a kid, and that's where the big elbows actually came from. <laughs> Interestingly, this armor, which is made out of rubber, um, was made for the film Richard III, Laurence Olivier's film Richard III, um, under the, the historical advice and consultancy with Sir James Mann, who was one of my predecessors as arms and armor curator at the Wallace Collection. And as consultant on this film, Sir James recommended that A21, the equestrian armor we've just seen, should be used as the reference for King Richard's armor. But Laurence Olivier wanted bigger elbows. <laughs> And then the legs represent another departure. This is where we enter the realm of fantasy armor. Um, you know, I just, I looked at a lot of real German legs and, you know, I couldn't learn to love what the real things were and I had my own idea about things. And I thought the knees should match the elbows. <laughs> and I made that up. I admit it now. That is a figment of my imagination. I would, if you'd asked me, I would have tried to justify it by pointing to this extreme, this extremely unusual depiction of an armor by Martin Schoenauer. Um, but that's really not the same thing. It's still a bit spiky, but it isn't the same thing. I'm, at this point, I'm off on one, and I'm not sticking as rigorously to my sources as I really should be. And that's why this armor, in the end, wasn't as good as it should have been. Anyway, it wasn't too bad. Uh, that's how it ended up. Um, and you might wonder why I haven't put the gauntlets on. Uh, the reason is that when we were cutting, le this armor took a lot longer to assemble after polishing than we realized. I, I said to Peter, I'll oh, come down. On the Monday, I can stay overnight. We can finish on Tuesday morning. I'll take the armor home. Five days later, we were, we were still putting this armor together, and we were doing very late nights, and I was working, you know, basically as his assistant, trying to get this thing fully assembled. And cutting pieces of oil tad leather at 2 o'clock in the morning with a razor-sharp knife is not usually a good idea. And I cut the end of my finger off, one of my fingers off, 
And at the middle of the night, we had to stop work. Toby was bleeding on the armor. We had to go to the hospital, and I had to get my finger glued back on. Um, actually, it's funny. This is where sometimes you find out funny things about your armor. Um, when I came out of the, of, the, of the surgery, Peter, Peter Light, the armorer, was sitting on the floor in the children's area playing with the little plastic train, making train noises. I said, Peter, come here. I'm finished, we have to go. And he stood up and tried to pretend that he hadn't been playing with the train. So. <laughs> Strange. So I'm hiding the fact with the gauntlets that I have a bandaged finger and trying to, to look cool about it. Um, you can see there's a bandage there on the, on the flip side, but that's how, that's how the armor turned out. For the time, consider again, this is 1997, 1998. This was a, I have to say, in all objectivity, this was a pretty good armor for the time. Um, but now, the, you know, armor building, the living history community has moved on a lot. From, from, from this point. There are a lot more people wearing much better stuff than this now. Um, I was pleased also because this is the first armor where I got the male elements to work well. Uh, the male elements supplementing the plate elements. This is really hard. You know, sewing mail to bits of fabric is a real pain in the um, And sometimes you have to just go there. You have to do the things that are time consuming and difficult to get it right. And I would, I would again encourage people not to look for shortcuts. If it's gonna take you, you know, four hours to sew on one sleeve and then four hours to sew on the other sleeve, that's what it takes and you gotta do it if you're serious about it. So there it is. Um, then I sold that armor, I traded up because I'd, I'd already worked with Robert McPherson a little bit um, on that previous armor, and now I'd gotten a taste of a little bit of a good thing, and I wanted to do something more major, so I sold that armor to an American collector for a lot more money than I expected, actually. <laughs> um, and that essentially helped me, you know, fund, fund my next armor. By this point, I was doing my PhD, and I was doing a PhD uh, in, really inspired by my encounters with um, funerary sculpture in the Yorkshire area where I was still living. I was looking at these funerary effigies, which are life-sized um, figures, carvings of dead knights. They're representations of a deceased knight sitting there in the church. They're phenomenally well carved. They have all kinds of incredible armor details on them. What's what I found to be wonderful about them, looking at them, was that they, in some ways, they were better than the surviving armor sitting in a museum case somewhere because it had the person inside it. It, it showed you what the thing was originally meant to look like. And I, you know, by this point, I was getting very obsessed with the original historical living context. And the effigies were, were the subject I wanted to pursue in my PhD. But the, the effigies show you what things look like, uh, but they don't tell you how they work or why they would be built one way rather than another way. So I wanted to build an armor with, with uh, Robert McPherson uh, that would allow me to kind of supplement and expand my PhD research by hazarding my own body in the, in the name of uh, historical experimentation. So, you know, we were looking at these sculptures. This is a, one of the effigies I'm referring to and then trying to translate that very specifically and as faithfully as we possibly could onto a real armor. This is the armor when it's half done in the, in the workshop in one of the many, many fittings. Um, and we're trying to achieve that same artistic impact that the real object has, and yet also, if we've got it right, if we're faithful to what's there, we should learn something about how the thing works. And when we learn that, we might then be able to draw some conclusions of how these weird English armors might look and feel and function differently than continental ones. Um, this is another key point that it was introduced to me in this project was the incredible precision that really good armor needs to have to work well. It needs to fit and follow the contours of your particular body 
very, very closely indeed. And sometimes it's a matter of saying, the greaves are not going to work well enough because your shoes have got a couple of millimeters more material on the front than they should. That pinching, the pinching action I'm making in this photograph is showing that, that, that there's a bit too much material in there. The shoe is taking up too much space. So the armor is, isn't fitting quite as close and perfectly as it ought to. We're talking, a fine armor should be like a skin. It should look like it's kind of been spray painted onto you. When you look at the real armors of this period, that's why they look like people stood there in front of you, all those beautiful contours, because of that extremely close fit. And the close fit, that perfect efficiency, the, close, the closeness of the fit, means that you're not carrying any more weight than you absolutely have to either. The thing is a bit bigger and clunkier than you are, you're carrying more weight than you need to be. And even the difference of a couple of pounds here or there makes a really big difference in practical terms. So I had to throw out these incredibly expensive medieval shoes at the uh, demand of my armor and get a completely new pair made that had two millimeters less material on the front. And there's just, that's an example of how the plates are designed to sit very closely over um, the foot. You know, the plating, the armor plating of the foot should not create the effect of a clown shoe. If it does, you're doing something wrong. Um, you need to have a smaller, more sculpted, closer fitting undergarment. These things are not designed to go over combat boots. So there's the finished elements. Now one of the key things we found with this armor, again following faithfully what the artists are showing us, the plates overlap downwards on English armors, um, tile-wise. Whereas on most surviving sabatons, continental sabatons, they go the other way. The plates are riveted to each other, they pivot on each other like any other articulating joint on an armor. And that's that. They can't do that if they're overlapping this way. But they all are on the English armors. And this implied to us that they we're dealing with a fundamentally different form of construction here. Um, this is the construction that we inferred based on the external appearance of the piece. Um, often the English sculptors of those monuments are very diligent about putting the rivets where they're supposed to be, and they never really showed rivets on the sabatons. So that implied to us that you're dealing with an internal leather construction rather than a hard riveted pivoted construction. And that was interesting. We just built it because that's what seemed to be there. And that's how we were going to find out about something. I was really interested in what happened with these in, in uh, experimentation, because they actually worked phenomenally well. The English tended to fight on foot, almost habitually on foot. They didn't, knights, English knights didn't fight on horseback that often, although they did sometimes. And so the English sabaton seems to be taking account of the particular fighting style of the person wearing the armor. I only found accidentally that this construction is much more hard wearing and much more functional when you're in mud up to your knees uh, and the thing is clotted with mud and you know, you're in sand and grit and you know, with an articulated pivoted joint if you get enough grit and stuff stuck in there the plates can start to jam up and start to stick and they, they might still work but they're not working as well whereas this, this construction you can be completely covered in in mud and dirt and crap, and, and they still work, and there's no functional um, decline. I thought that was quite interesting. That's one of the many things we learned. Also, we tried to follow details, again, being faithful to the letter, uh, what we're seeing in the art. In, the English always have these little male patches at the ankles. They have little ankle voiders, if you will. And they need that because they, notice they cut the they cut the sabaton low around the ankle, whereas a continental sabaton would go up higher into the greave to overlap. And that's maybe better protection, but it's, it starts to limit the rotational movement of the foot. If you cut it low, you can still have a completely free range of motion, uh, which the English want, and they're fighting on foot. So they stick a bit of mail in there just to help cover the gap and the rare chance that an arrow or something sharp goes in there. Um, so that sort of completed the, the look of the English feet, and 
And I just got more out of this process by being totally as faithful and rigorous as I could down to the detail and not reserving for myself the kind of presumptuous right to pass judgment on which elements of this I was going to take and which I was going to ignore. You either build it or you don't. If you don't like it, pick a different source and follow that one instead. Try not to change the source too much based on your own opinions. I've found you get more out of it if you just go with what's really there. The process has a kind of validity then. The results of any experiment, you're only going to learn something valuable based on the quality of what you build. So for me, if I want to publish this, I have to try and enforce the validity of the experimental conditions as far as I can. Um, that's just a nice image of the sabatons put together with the greaves, the greaves following very closely the shape of the leg when all the plates are fitting well. You can just stick spurs on your feet like you would if you weren't wearing armor. A lot of technical challenges actually become much easier when you just do it the way they did it. Um, another real fantastic aspect of this project was just to get on, our, on the artistic level to translate the depiction of something in stone to what the work of art would have looked like in life. These beautiful contrasts between the black and steel and the, and the gold in this case. On several effigies, I found significant traces of, go of not only gold paint on those gilded areas, but black paint on the main steel areas. And when, they, when, when the effigy carvers intend to show you a polished surface, they just polish the alabaster. They don't put paint on it. They're slapping back black paint all over it. That means that there's something else intended to be there. Paint doesn't survive on the effigies very well, but if you, you stick your, your head through the cobwebs and through the spiders, you can see that there's often a lot more paint still remaining on the undersides of these things. So that was what I was trying to, to recreate with Mac in this armor. Um, there are also, there are, in this case, there are also fundamental constructional differences too. The English build the cuirass, they tend to build it in two distinct elements. You, the skirts, which are normally riveted and articulated onto the upper body armor, on the English armors are worn completely separately. The skirt is a self-supporting, totally separate element. And actually, if you read English documents, English inventories of armor, they go and they say the van braces, the gauntlets, the helmet, the cuirass, and the ponce of plates, the ponce or skirt of plates, that element is always listed as a separate piece. It's not an integral part of the cuirass. Um, that's a nice example, actually, of how the documents and the other visual sources sometimes match up nicely. It doesn't happen very often, but it's nice when it does happen. So there's that separate element. Um, with a weight very closely fitted, waist plate, um, interacting nicely with the body armor, closing up over the attachment method of the legs. It's, it's all very, uh, very beautiful assembly, very elegant assembly. Um, there are the arms. The arms also, both upper arms and upper legs were fully enclosed. Um, more difficult in terms of, you know, as a technological thing to do, but much more protective if you get it right. <clears throat> oh, that's a nice detail, actually. Again, another, another of many things that encourage you to believe that the effigies are well observed showing you the reality of what was really there. You look on this effigy, you've got the little laces poking out below the pauldron. That's a really nicely observed thing. That's something that often happens when you've got the points holding up the arm defense, they extend downwards and their ends sometimes poke through the shoulder. Um, the effigy carver doesn't have to have included that. He's included that to encourage the verisimilitude, the, 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 the um, the impression of verisimilitude on the, on the artwork. Um, another interesting thing is the cutout. The English, the English armors have these often very dramatic cutouts, not just in the front, but also in the back, to allow for a weapon placed under the arm to just not interfere 
with the function of the armor too much otherwise. Um, that's an interesting feature because it's primarily an issue for cavalry use rather than foot combat, but it just shows that they had to be aware of that as well. Um, the gauntlets too, you know, the gauntlet is something that's, you know, very, very um, complex mechanical construction. The gauntlets on the effigies are one of the areas that's often most damaged. When iconoclasts in the 16th or 17th century decide that images are sacrilegious and they need to take axes to them, the gauntlets are the first things that get smashed off. Um, so, you know, reconstructing them and, you know, really trying to get a sense of them was, was quite an important part of the project, too. Um, so there they are, the lining gloves sewn in and so forth. So the full effect is, was, pretty, was pretty great on this armor. Um, the one interesting question um, was the, the question of visors. You know, the effigies don't usually have visors because they want you to see that there's a person inside. It's the person you're praying for when you look at an effigy. Um, and this has led a lot of people to wonder whether the English didn't wear visors. They fought on foot, they needed to see, they needed to breathe, maybe they didn't wear visors. I think they did, they seem to have done. It doesn't really make much sense to have all this fantastic hardened steel protection for your entire body and the backs of your legs included, uh, and then leave your face totally uncovered, one of the most vulnerable, vital parts of you uh, completely uncovered. Um, so this is where we have to interpret the sculpture. Looking at other sources like this English manuscript detail, you see people wearing visors. Henry V is described as wearing a visor on his helmet at the Battle of Agincourt. They wore visors, but they're not on the effigies. So it's a challenge to then find, okay, how do I complete? Right now I look like an effigy, but the armor isn't finished, so what do we do? We have to find other sources that complement closely what we're building. <laughs> Um, so that visor, we built, we built a field visor that's based closely on some of those manuscript illustrated sources. Uh, it doesn't look quite like anything that survives, but it has relatives in surviving places. And this visor was a, a fantastic uh, experience for me because as a jouster, after you know, 15 years of doing this at this point, um, I had come to equate the inability to see or hear or breathe with safety. Um, if you can't do any of those things, you're safe. Everything's safe inside. Um, and I could see really well out of this helmet. The visibility, the ventilation was fantastic. Uh, and I actually felt quite anxious wearing it because I felt like I can see and breathe too well here. This is a bit like plexiglass or something. You know, there's, there's enough visual information coming through to you that your brain is quite happily stitching the gaps together and it feels transparent. And I, I felt very anxious and, and, and not terribly happy in that visor actually because I didn't want to see that much. Um, but you know, interesting exploration of the psychological elements of the armor wearing process. What's going on in your head while you're inside. Um, and that's one of those interesting examples where I was sort of confronted by my own um, mental state in the armor. Um, then a South African collector offered me a suitcase full of money uh, for that armor. And at that point in my life, I'd just gotten a job in London. Um, everything had changed rather suddenly. It's hard to say no to a big suitcase full of money. Um, walking down, you know, Kensington High Street in London with a suitcase full of money was not an experience I had encountered before and it's hard to say no to, but it did allow me to some extent to move on to my next project with another armor, an armor I'd only recently met uh, before this. This is, we're now in 2005, 2006. Um, per Lillelund Jensen, a Danish armor living in Sweden, Someone, he didn't make armor professionally. Uh, he was an industrial metal worker. He built trains and, you know, giant metal staircases for office buildings and things. And he made armor purely for his own amusement. Uh, and he was mainly interested in Milanese armor of the late 15th and early 16th centuries. And he just did it with such passion, you know, such obsession. It was his personal interest, his personal passion. 
um, that I just, it was, his pieces were so like the real thing, it was shocking. He sent me some pictures of some of his work, some details, and I knew he'd been traveling in Mantua and various places, and I thought he was sending me his holiday snaps. You know, I saw this elbow, and I thought, oh yeah, that's from Mantua, he's in Mantua, it's nice of him to send me a picture, until I realized the maker's mark was in the wrong place. Uh, what's going on here? It was his work. It really is almost easily mistaken for the real thing. So I wanted to work with him and, you know, his, his, his workshop and his house is a wonderful place. It's just littered with armor that looks like lost, real things. Um, and we, we embarked on an Italian armor project. One of the issues, one of the functional issues I encountered with the English armor was that it's primarily designed for fighting on foot. It works reasonably well on horseback but it's, I, it's optimized for fighting on foot. I don't really fight on foot that often. I mainly joust and fight on horseback. So for me, it wasn't really the ideal style, even though I built it for my PhD. I built it for different reasons than what was ideal for fighting in for me. Um, so an Italian armor was really much more ideal. An Italian armor is very heavily weighted towards fighting on horseback. Um, so that's what, we, what, that's what we embarked on. Here you can see an early part of the process where he's traced my body very exactly, and then he's drawing a detailed blueprint, essentially, of the armor on top of my body. Um, and that was the, different armors work in different ways, but this was a real way of ensuring that a real design, taken precisely from a real armor, could be size all adjusted to work on my body. And the great thing, too, about building an Italian armor, unlike the English stuff, is that you have lots of real Italian armor surviving that you can look at. You know, your, your evidence is e a lot easier to work with and it's not nearly so speculative. The speculation is fun and everything, but you never really can have confidence that you've done it right. You can have confidence with the Italian armor because we have 13 Itali full Italian armor surviving in good condition. Um, and you also have a profusion of the most fantastic art ever created. You know, you take an Italian armor project and you just have to look at all those Piero della Francesca's and uh, Mantegna's and, you know, it, 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 as a style, it takes you right to the heart of the Renaissance. So that was a, just a wonderful part of the project as well. And there it is in process, various parts of it coming together, various, again, the fittings, the cups of tea, uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, and there it is finished. And I was pleased with the overall and, and effect because I really, looking at a couple of the pictures, it seemed like it really started to look like those Italian armored saints. The way the body is broken up, the proportions that, the emphasis as on the beauty growing out of the essential sculptural form. There's not much fluting, the perfection of form and line, transforming the wearer into a living sculpture. This is what it's all about. It's really heavy though. Um, so if you want to see how well I do in it, this is the armor that I'm wearing um, at the Tournament of the Phoenix uh, at the weekend. Thank you very much. <laughs>